Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to JLA. Uh, we have Suyash Joshi with us, who is going to talk about deploying ML models with Java. So a bit about Suyash. He is a developer advocate at Oracle. He brings extensive Java development experience. And for the past two years, he has been advocating the use of machine learning libraries using Java. He is also an author of forthcoming book on this topic and a part-time magician. We are very excited to have Suyash present to us the magic of machine learning and Java. Over to you, Suyash. Thank you so much, Muktesh, for the lovely introduction. Hello, everyone. If you're watching live, hello, or if you're going to watch the recording, uh, welcome. My name is Suyash, like Muktesh said, and I also want to thank uh, the amazing conference organizers for making this happen. End of the year, what a way to uh, end 2020 by sharing some Java love. So. I love Java. I've been developing with Java for, wow, 10 years, maybe. Uh, mostly as a software engineer, then I transitioned into developer advocacy about two and a half years ago. And I love doing that. And for the last two years, I've been also playing with machine learning. And machine learning, <clears throat> not just in Python, which seems to be the dominant language, but there are also a lot of cool libraries that you can do pretty much what you can do in Python today in Java. So I'll share with you some of that. But my focus would be very specific. I wanna show you cool examples and uh, feel free to tweet if you saw anything that you like, you can use my handle or the conference handle. So <clears throat> just, you know, this is the, Loris had me put this slide. So here you are, the safe harbor statement, you can read it. <clears throat> Nothing I'm saying is anything really company specific, uh, so, so forth. So this is the goal. I will give a little quick rundown of machine learning. We have limited time. So I would love to take your questions in the end. Please have them coming. Muktesh will help me answer, uh, sort those out. And I'll give you a overview of this new field called ML engineering. And then we'll talk about the exciting stuff, which is how to do that with Java. And uh, I'll show you some live demos, uh, code, uh, talk about some libraries and frameworks. And then uh, finally, in the end, I'll love to take your questions. So uh, machine learning is, as you know, it's the hot buzz right now. And inside of machine learning, machine learning is a big umbrella. And inside of that, the, the most exciting technology in the last few years has been deep learning. And what can you do with, with this technology? A lot of people ask, perhaps those who are new to it. So you might have seen examples like classifying images, detecting it, what, what kind of image it is, right? So we call that image classification or image segmentation, many words, but, in, but at the high level, it can be problem solved by classifying data or doing regression analysis. This is very useful when doing pre, uh, stock prediction or forecasting, perhaps the COVID pandemic, what would it look like in 2021? You would run a regression analysis. You can do uh, clustering. Again, maybe a medical example. You can give uh, the model a bunch of x-rays and it will cluster similar looking x-rays. So perhaps the lungs that are infected by COVID model would learn the pattern and cluster similar looking x-rays. And other things like dimensionality reduction and reinforcement learning, a little bit more fancy, but reinforcement learning is gaining a lot of popularity, especially with games, game AI and whatnot, and uh, robotic uh, automation uh, when robot moves around. And, 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 and they use, uh, you know, uh, these are not separate. You can have an ensemble of machine learning models. So a model does this classification, model does clustering, model does rec and, and you can have a comprehensive system but this just is a big picture. Why is this different and why is this a, such a breakthrough? Well, if you look at the, the box which says algorithm, that is how we write code today, right? We write Java code, JavaScript, Python code, any code. It's uh, imperative. We write the logic, conditional logic, right? The business logic, and we deal with some data, but we are, we are handwriting everything. The approach with machine learning or deep learning now is that you don't have to write all this code. Uh, so that's why the, the, there's also the phrase called data is the new oil. Because what you're doing is 
you're providing a lot of data to ML model. And the code you write is very specific. It's to help create the model. And the data helps the model learn. That's why it's called machine learning because the model is learning based on data. And the more data generally you have in deep learning, the better the prediction of the model would be in real world. <clears throat> so I hope you got the idea. So the way you would write code, I'll show you some libraries. It's, it's going to be very specific to how to create a model, how to train a model, how to run inference of a model. And there's specific uh, lingo for that, that you have to learn and it's library specific, but uh, uh, generally they're talking about very machine learning specific uh, things. So there are two steps, essentially. There is the training step, I'm abstracting at very high level. When you train the model, and generally this is something uh, you don't have to do per se. Focus of my talk is more on the software engineering side. So I'll focus as an engineer or ML engineer what that person does. That person is mostly responsible for deploying the models in production. And uh, the trained model, you can per perhaps grab them from the web, through an API REST endpoint, or you can have a data scientist in your team who could do the training and then pass it to an ML engineer who would deploy these into production. And in production, the bar is even higher. So uh, here, what we're seeing is a bunch of training data sets and the data set come with label data. So that's the input to the model. So the, here there's different type of animals and it labels as a dog, it's a cat, it's a honey badger. And the model, you know, the graph you're seeing, it's, an, it's called deep neural network. It does a bunch of thing operations and it trains itself. And then it gives a prediction. When you send a new image to it, is it a dog, is it a cat, is it a raccoon? And it gives a prediction on that. <clears throat> Generally, it's like you can translate it into a percentage from zero to hundred percent, how sure it is. Deployment, we want the same thing, but the bar is higher because it's in production, right? Live systems. So. <clears throat> What I have here is the model life cycle, ML engineering model. You start by building the model and then evaluating the model. This is more the data science step, productionizing the model, which is where you deploy it, <clears throat> testing it, and actually, sorry, productionizing it. You can collapse the uh, deployment uh, before or after testing. Testing here uh, means not just the model testing, which happens before when you train it, but this is more software testing, integration testing, end-to-end -end testing. And then you deploy it in production and you monitor because these models, the performance don't remain the same. They, they sometimes degrade. So we wanna make sure it's performing. So <clears throat> Java plays a great role in all these areas. And these are the libraries. So for training, there are popular frameworks called DL4J, DJL, which I'll demo, Tribue, came out of Oracle Lab, Spark ML, if you use Spark for big data, you can run ML. If you wanna do inferencing, so training is one and then inferencing, same libraries, but even more. Uh, you can use the popular library PyTorch. It has a binding for Java. You can use TensorFlow. It also has its support for Java and coming soon for training as well. Again, there's another framework called Onyx, O-N-N-X. It allows you to convert one model to another. There is another framework called MXNet. So now we're going to the software engineering realm, the gray box. This is how do we deploy these models in production? And uh, what do we do on the cloud, right? Uh, how do we deploy in the cloud? Very, you know, the popular technologies, perhaps some sessions you attended today, microservices like Heladon, Micronaut, I'll talk about Micronaut today, or serverless functions. And then you also need a repository on the cloud for your model. Some people call it model zoo, where the models is saved. <clears throat> I'm showing the machine learning pipeline here, end to end. And all of these tasks we can do as Java developers because now there are frameworks that allow you to do everything from training, inferencing, deploying, deploying on the cloud and doing performance analysis. So there are two libraries for performance analysis graph pipe and ml flow why is this such a big deal this is a famous uh, somebody popular on twitter they tweet a lot around ml engineering and i had a conversation with them she mentioned that uh, machine learning engineering is 10 percent machine learning engineering 
and 90% software engineering. So if you're a software engineer, Java engineer, and you want to go into this field called ML engineering or machine learning, this is the best way or the best pathway I can, I can see myself or for anyone else. So because the skills are very transferable, uh, I talk to Java developers and they say, do I have to forget everything that I know, you know, career that I've spent building around Java and now uh, learn Python and then TensorFlow? And the answer is, you know, it's up to you, but answer is you don't have to because like what I showed you and I'm going to show you demos, all these libraries, you can do exact same thing in Java. And even better for running applications in production, Java is much more robust, scalable. The Java infrastructure is dominant in the enterprise for in the production environment. So companies are looking to integrate in their current existing ecosystem. Perhaps you, you can uh, look at your company versus creating a whole new stack. So if you're a Java shop, better off using a framework that supports Java and machine learning than creating something totally new around Python and then use integrating that. So now I'm going to switch gear, talk a little bit about cloud deployment and from software engineering side. As you already know, we started back in the day with waterfall model where we built single giant application, monolithic applications. And the architecture of server client was very rudimentary. And of course, everything had to be stored in data centers because they were expensive. Computers weren't as powerful. Then came the era of agile development and the classic MVC architecture. And if you're in Java world, been around, you know, you know, Spring MVC and other MVC frameworks became very popular. And in, in the deployment world, this concept of virtual servers, shared hosting came about. Well, since 2010 until now and going forward, we are in much more advanced agile life cycle of software, right? Continuous CI, CD everywhere. The applications aren't developed as, you know, in MVC style anymore. They are more developed like as components and components are, you know, containerized and they're deployed as microservices. And, and it's not, you know, these are not uh, hard shifts, you know, software is, it takes time. Software architecture takes time to change and there is no good or bad. This is one popular approach that I'm showing, the popular paradigm that is occurring right now. And the apps are moving to the cloud. Everything is on the cloud versus running it on-prem. There's still value for on-prem and using other types of architecture, but this is the dominant uh, pattern. So <clears throat> there are two, there's a term called cloud native technology. Cloud native technology, for those who are new means, technologies that were born in the cloud. So there are two popular technologies, one called serverless functions. Uh, and at Oracle, we have an offering called serverless function or Oracle cloud function. And we also have an open source framework for doing that. And you can do that in your own machine. You don't have to use Oracle cloud or anywhere else called FN project, where you can write, where you can even further break down your business logic into functions, functions as a service that you can deploy on the cloud, on your server, on your machine and, and invoke that. And the benefit is that you only pay when you run that server, when you run that function, not when the whole server is up and running. So it's, it's, it's safe cost, it's very efficient, but it has some pros and cons. So there is the other popular paradigm called cloud native application development architecture. And there are a bunch of technologies in the Java world now. Uh, the two popular ones that I like are Micronaut and Peladon. And they allow you to write microservice architecture, uh, which can run on the cloud very easily. You know, in the last slide I showed, it can be containerized as Docker container and be deployed and orchestrated uh, via Kubernetes environment. <clears throat> how does this help with machine learning? Well, here is kind of how it helps. If you are using a pre-trained machine learning model or in your environment, you want to deploy a machine learning model that let's say will do text analysis. There's a bunch of text. Let's say you work at a finance company, you want to analyze reports, you want to parse text out, you want to do sentiment analysis, all kind of stuff. You create a service for ML inferencing and the model can come from the web, 
pre-trained model or your data science team can give it to you. And then all this function would do is would take whatever text, whatever input you need to provide it, and it runs the prediction and gives you the, uh, the output. Versus if you want to do, so this is a very particular use case or for image recognition. You upload the image and it tells you the label. This is the image, right? Very, the common ML jobs for your business. So that's one approach. The other approach is if you want to do training and inference full on. Now we're not talking about, you know, just calling a function to do run some kind of inference, but we want to have a whole sophisticated architecture which has our business logic, you know, uh, which has the machine learning logic. And for that, better student is, is something like a full, fully supportive uh, cloud native architecture like Micronaut or Heladon. And you can also have a service there that does inference as well. <clears throat> so there are various ways to architect software these days. These are just two approaches that I thought uh, uh, seem pretty good. So I'm going to talk uh, in this context. Yes. yes. So yes, looks like the slides are stuck again. Slides are stuck. Hmm. Okay, now they are moving. I mean, okay, is are people? Uh, is the audience there? Is people watching this thing, or it got? Yeah, no, no, okay. they are able to see, but they were wondering if the slides are moving or not. It's, it's moving. It's I'm on this one slide. I'm about to move. Oh, okay. uh, <clears throat> thank you for checking, though. Yes. Uh, okay. So how would you go about architecting this type of application? Well, this is a <clears throat> this is one common way uh, that we propose. So you can have your different clients. You can have your web app, your mobile service, your mobile app, you know, or some other client, desktop client could be, you know. Um, <clears throat> or it, 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 it could be an IoT device. And those clients would make API request and the request entity in the modern architecture goes through an API gateway. API gateway decides which service will handle which request. And now further, we can deploy these services in, in a Kubernetes cluster. So we are dedicating a resource, uh, a container that would run the service. <clears throat> Perhaps one container would have one service like shown in this example, or it can have more than one service. And the service don't all have to be in the same language. That's the beauty of microservice architecture. Your team can pick best language or framework, unlike old days where it would be one giant code base and somebody has picked one framework and everybody's stuck with that. Because microservice lives in their own world, you can have your own uh, framework. So let's say a Java service or a Go service, and then they can talk to uh, a, a data store. The API, how you would define those is up to you. This is one popular way uh, in machine learning world. So generally you need APIs that can get the model, right? Very essential. And not only get the model, but you want to get some metadata about the model. What version is the model? When was it last trained? Uh, are there other models? You know, you want to hack model repository if that model is not good enough. And then for like say, particular task. If I want to do image classification, I can make a request for post request where I send it in my image and it returns the prediction or for text analysis. <clears throat> All right. So we're about to jump into the demo. But before I do that, I want to put the slide and show you these are various Java based machine learning frameworks and libraries that you can run. And it allows you, some allow you to do just inference like PyTorch and TensorFlow. And some allow you to do full end-to-end -end, like DJL, uh, Tribue. A Tribue is more for classic machine learning than for deep learning at this moment. And then DL4j is a very comprehensive library. And they're very open, they're all open source friendly licenses that you can use. Uh, so with that, let's dive into code demo. I'm gonna switch from PowerPoint to my favorite ID these days, Visual Studio Code. Uh, and I'm going <clears> to <throat> walk you through a application, uh, a demo application or example app, which I modified a little bit. So here uh, I have a, if you're familiar with Micronaut, this is a classic Micronaut application. <clears throat> Let me just quickly show you. 
<clears throat> and uh, here I have uh, added a dependency for TensorFlow. Now TensorFlow for Java. And uh, this allows me to bring TensorFlow for Java library along with, of course, it has Micronaut and various various Micronaut uh, services or various Micronaut uh, components are here. <clears throat> and the app is architected in a it has both client and server, a Java client, and uh, what we are more interested in is in the server. So server, and we have a controller, and I've created a controller for machine learning. So when somebody goes to this application at this endpoint, ML, uh, we want to give the prediction. We want to give a prediction. And uh, I have a simple get request for demo purpose, but you can have a post request, and you can accept you can accept some kind of some kind of data here that uh, you can do something on. So if it is a text, you can grab a bunch of text, and that uh, you can do text analysis on, right? So uh, <clears throat> and to handle that, we've created a service uh, using Micronaut that would give us the prediction. So in this example. It's very simple. Uh, it's a singleton class, and all I'm doing inside of it, I am invoking the TensorFlow uh, model. And the way I'm doing it is, it's it's a little bit. Uh, I don't want to go into too much into detail of TensorFlow, but essentially what it does, it uh, here. So I'm currently I'm having some trouble importing importing the jars, uh, so the project is not running. But I'm going to show you a different project that's working. But uh, it should work, and I will up upload this on GitHub uh, after I'm done with this talk this weekend. And uh, you should be able to use this, run this uh, with this example that I'm uh, talking about. And here, all it does, it just basically returns the TensorFlow version uh, at this uh, endpoint, this uh, dat slash ML. And it would say, hello from TensorFlow version that. Uh, it's a hard-coded response. It's not really a prediction because we're not taking any data right now. So that's that's one way how we can very easily bring in TensorFlow in our uh, Micronaut applications. Uh, and let me actually show you some actual machine learning demo because my favorite library is... Uh, let's just do... Let's do this one. <clears throat> Uh oh, not this one. There are a bunch of examples I have here. Uh, Micronaut. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm gonna here. I'm gonna walk you through. This is a Gradle project that how we can do how we can run training. So this is example. It's it comes from a different library, not TensorFlow. Now I'm using a library called DJL, Deep Java Library. It's Apache licensed. And here we have a, uh, a model that I grabbed from online. And uh, not the model, sorry, data set. And the data set, so like I said, remember, now we're talking about training, not just inferencing. So for training, we need data. And the data is bunch of images around of shoes and we are training a model that will detect what kind of when you send it a new image of a shoe perhaps you take an image and you can send it upload it it would info it would tell you what type of shoe this is based on all this training data as you can see there are different types they're generally classified into four data sets four kind boots sandal shoes and slipper and uh, I have some there is some code here that loads the data and generally these are the four classification labels and the images when we train model the model has to be trained on a particular format of images and when we do inference we need to make sure the images are in the same format so we have to do some data manipulation so in this case the images all have to be 100 by 100 and uh, we load the model uh, and then uh, basically we uh, this is the model. It's called ResNet 50. It's a very popular model for doing image recognition or uh, image any kind of image training. And uh, 
this is where the training starts so the training happens in 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 epochs epochs are these big training cycles so we're gonna run two cycle and every cycle the the data would come in batches batches of 32 32 images and this is the data set this is the folder where uh, where the images are stored and uh, generally it's good to split the training the data set into training and testing so here we split into 80 percent training and 20 percent testing which means 80 percent of this data would be trained and the rest 20 percent of data would be used later on when we're going to test the model models accuracy a very important concept in machine learning is called loss function and we use a particular type of loss function called softmax cross entropy loss very common and the goal is as we are training the model you generally see a graph we want to re reduce the loss function so here why don't i uh, Um, okay, just quickly, uh, this um, is, so it's going to start the training. I'm just going to let it run here and you'll see what it's doing. Uh, and uh, it, it takes a long time, so I'm, of course we are out of time. But uh, it's starting the training and it's going to show us uh, that the training, the accuracy here, you're seeing, it shows the accuracy and the softmax and it's just starting and it's going to start to show here numbers uh, so unfortunately we're out of time i apologize for the screw up i had one other demo for text sentiment analysis but uh yeah uh, i'll stop here and uh maybe i'll go back to slides happy to take any questions